Hello and welcome to another edition of Door County Today. I'm your host, Paul Renier of Door County Nature and Travel. August in Door County, what a beautiful time of year. The farmer's markets are bursting, the lake water is perfect for swimming, and the restaurants are humming like well-oiled machines. No discussion of Door County dining would be complete without mentioning fish boils, a local dining tradition that involves a fire, a large pot, fresh whitefish, potatoes, and onions. The first commercial fish boil was over 60 years ago, and there are some knowledgeable restaurateurs who will tell us how it all got started. Door County's farmer's markets offer an abundance of fresh produce in August, and we'll speak with John Gass, the editor of Edible Door, a new publication devoted to a shared appreciation of good local food. John will tell us about the food production and dining trends that set Door County apart. One of those destinations is Carlsville, located on Highway 42, a few miles north of Sturgeon Bay, which sports four restaurants, a dairy, a winery, a distillery, a candle works, a general store, a pet accessory store, and a major coffee roaster. Find out why many visitors consider Carlsville the gateway to Northern Door County. We'll also take a boat ride to Rock Island State Park, located just off neighboring Washington Island where no vehicles, including bicycles, are allowed for transport. That's right, this island park is only accessible by ferry or boat, and you'll have to hike or walk to enjoy its incredible natural setting. Now let's start this month's show with a sumptuous fish boil. People keep asking all the time, what, when did the fish boil start? The meal itself goes back to probably the turn of the uh, 19th century to the 20th century. Loggers were here and uh, sailors brought them in and they had cauldrons and they certainly had plenty of fish. Commercial fishermen uh, would use it as a way to feed the crews. You could boil the fish right on the boat itself on a pot-bellied stove. Very simple and, and meal with, of course, the available food. Somewhere along the line, somebody started the fish boil. Commercially, the uh, Viking Grill in Ellison Bay was the first one. Lawrence and Ed Wickman started it in about 1960 when tourism really turned around in this country. Well, they were having fish boils uh, for money makers for the community. But then it would say, come into the restaurant and they say, when's the next fish boil? Well, next year. It'll be next year. Well, we don't want to wait that long. Why can't you have it here? That was the early 60s. So Lawrence and Annette started the fish boil, and they're the only ones doing it commercially, and they'd serve up to 700, 800 people in one night. And I remember one time when we had a fish boil, we had 700, 900 people, but then we had buses. And that's, what, that's how the business grew. My dad had a bar over in Bailey's Harbor, and uh, he did a trout boil, and that would be back in the 46, 47. My brother and I were about nine, 10 years old. I recall coming up into the area as, as a kid, and I didn't see fish boil signs. I saw <laughs> trout boil signs. And when the lamprey killed off the trout, then they went to the next thing available, and that was whitefish. The basic meal is the same. They all feature Lake Michigan whitefish, usually fresh. Uh, right now, this time of the year, we get it delivered fresh the day of the boil. It probably was caught this morning. And we start out with our cauldron, and our cauldron is about oh, 20 gallons of water. And the first thing we put in is about three pounds of salt. The salt uh, is in there just a little bit for flavoring, but its real purpose is to bring all the fats and oils up to the top of the water. And there's a large amount of salt used. People think it's going to be salty, it isn't. We bring that uh, water to a boil, and when it's boiling, we start with our small new red potatoes. About 20 minutes into the time for the potatoes, I put another net on top of that, and it has all the fish in it. And the fish will be in for eight to 10 minutes. Then we'll put the onions in. The onions are small, sweet Spanish onions, and we'll cook them two, three minutes. When I first add the potatoes and when I first add the fish, I do put just another pinch of salt in. Um, pinch of salt is really a misnomer. In the first boil, it's pounds, not pinches. You can see the oils that are forming now. It's just a little bit on the top. This is a first boil. And the very first boil, you don't have as much oils as you do the second and the third one. Although, when we do boil it over, 
we lose about five gallons of water. So 20 gallons, so about a quarter of the water is replaced each, uh, each uh, boil. Now you can see the fish here is, is getting done just by looking in here at it. It's starting to float a little bit and that'll happen about four minutes. Yeah, three, four minutes just before it's about time to take off. Now here's our fuel oil, which we use to boil over with. Not a big deal, you know, but it's, it's there. I'm not. <laughs> See how long it lasted? I know a lot of people think that the fish boil is, uh, the overboil is for the show. It certainly is a spectacular event, but it does have that purpose. It, you don't, if, if you didn't and you pulled the uh, nets out without doing the boil off, you really would want to rinse it or somehow, and of course with a big outdoor net, that wouldn't be a very easy process. We open the first Friday in April, and I boil every Friday from April to the end of December. In winter, we, we get them out for a few minutes to watch the, the climax of the boil, but the rest of the time they're comfortably sitting in their tables inside. Door County is such a unique place, and they're up here and they're having fun. Weather's nice, they're on vacation. Yeah, people stopped earlier, what time is your boil over? Well, you know, if it boils in time, it'll be at 4.30. If it doesn't, well, it won't. Yeah, not everybody did it like we did. We did it for a sort of like, a, more like a show, making it wonderful to come to it. Makes my mouth water, it really does. <laughs> The number of farmers markets we're seeing here in Door County is in direct relationship to the number of people that are offering a product uh, and we're seeing a varied number but more and more of these places that are actually growing produce on their little plots, their little mini farms around Door County want an outlet and this is the best and simplest way to get that outlet to them and of course what a better place to do it than here in Door County where we have a built-in tourism buying base here so it's so you see it in all the various tourism locations we've got what seven in all right now on the peninsula and we're seeing them spread from really north to south pretty much from sturgeon bay all the way up to sister bay and they're kind of scattered on different days so it, that's really kind of nice so people can actually go in and try different ones and of course you see a lot of the similar vendors in the different places but at the same time you see a lot of different product too i'm I've always amazed when i go into them just to see the variety and what people are actually making. Anything from honey to goat cheese to whatever. I mean, stuff you never would have seen before uh, in farmer's markets. Not that farmer's markets are anything new on the peninsula. They've been around for, for a long time, but I think it's just the diversity that we're seeing now that's, that's so exciting and is really drawing more and more people to them. It's really neat to see the color and variety of, of vegetable that we get. My wife is a member of a CSA now, so we get produce delivered to us on a regular basis. So it's given me a new understanding a little bit of, of all the variety of produce that we had. I used to just think it was pretty much just romaine lettuce and that was it. Um, but there are just so many different kinds of vegetables out there to basically enjoy. That's part of it is just the learning element of going to some of these and finding out exactly what it is that they have. People are just so knowledgeable of what they're growing and the benefits that you get from them. And again, you get into other things too. More and more of these farm markets are getting into actual serving food, which to be honest with you, is really one of my favorites. I mean, if, when I, if I go to a farmer's market and don't come away with, with a cherry brat or, a, or something else in the process, it's kind of disappointing because there are so many good, good food products that are actually being served hot and ready for you to eat, which is probably the best part for me because I just love eating, so it really fits well. But the variety now is really what is part of the appeal of going to the farmer's market. And, and it's, it seems like you always find some new product each time you go to it. They've kind of be become a blend of produce along with arts and crafts, simply because we have so many good artisans here on the peninsula that they've kind of got into the same thing that the food producers have. I think when it comes to the variety of the farm market, that's really one of the real appeals to it. I, I guess if I drew a comparison, it'd be a little bit like the community concert series that we have here. Each one has its own unique setting. Each has its own little unique thing that it has to offer. In a way, it's, it's promoting its area, and each one is trying to, is finding that little nook 
as another means to promote their community and their business community at the same time and bring people into the community is through this, whether or not it's by music or it's by produce or it's arts and crafts. And I think that's what you're seeing with farm markets right now. Now, when it comes to you know, how each one is potentially different, in many cases you'd say, well, how could they vary? I think more than anything else, they vary because of the setting that they're in. You probably will find very similar things in each of the locations because some of the vendors are pretty similar in some cases. But yet, there are some that are very locally based and, and maybe in the Bailey's Harbor area, they only necessarily come into Bailey's Harbor to do their sales. I know some of the people we've dealt with, with Edible Door, um, just service various certain farm markets and that's the only ones they go to once a week. Obviously, I think what they do is they each try to find that one week. Normally, they don't like the, the step on, each, on top of each other because I don't think that's really good business. Um, and I think at the same time, they each want to carve their own niche. The one here in Bailey's Harbor, which again is an idyllic setting right here on Town Square. Where else, else could you find a more perfect place to be? You know, according to the pass up at Sister Bay, really fits nicely because of the historic nature of where it's located. I mean, that's really from a farm standpoint, I don't know if you could find a better place to do it. You know, each one is unique in its own way, and I think that's the neat part about it. So if you aren't just going to buy produce, which obviously most people are, the neat, neat thing about farm markets is that there's appealing to tourists as the art of the locals. I'm seeing more and more and more locals start to use farm markets. I think for the longest time people would say, well, I'll just go to the grocery store and get it, and, and that's fine and good. But now you're seeing more and more people you know locally make that trek to the farm market. The best idea would be to go out and, and visit all of them. Uh, they're, just, they're just such a variety out there, and I think they'll find each one unique in its own way. And more than just the opportunity to go out and buy produce and, uh, and feel your needs as far as, as the purchase, it's just the, the experience of being out in a community, a setting. You meet new people each time. The people that are, that are providing the, the products are all very amiable people. They're all fun to talk to, and each have their own stories. So um, I think you'll, you'll find it to be a very fun and, and unique experience. Carlsville got its name from, I don't know how many Carls lived here initially. I... There were supposed to be three gentlemen named Carl. Carl Schultz, Carl, Carl Krieger, Carl Volzin, Carl Schuster, and a bunch of others. I've heard 8, 10, 12, or whatever. I don't know. I think a lot of that is hearsay, but I guess Carlsville started with the name Carl from back in the 1800s of however many Carls lived here. The first business was the roadhouse which just burned down and that was what 103 years 106 years old it was known as the carlsville bar originally and there was a reporter that referred to this as a southern type roadhouse because of the veranda that'd be a good thing to call it's called it the roadhouse i didn't have a vision at all. Just I, I just bought it just bought i it. figured i've cooked for five kids i can cook for a couple more it used to be lunch and dinner now it's just a menu it, we serve everything from open which which is 11 o'clock to close, which is 9 o'clock. Several years ago, we got into roasted chicken. It has become kind of a trademark of ours. And we're the only place in town that serves a burger. We had a big fire June 14th of 2011. I decided to rebuild it, and we finally got to open up July 18th of 2012. The winery started in 1974. It was the old Carlsville Elementary School from 1868 till 1963. In 1984, my family bought the winery. We have a lacrosse grape that we produce and bottle that's from an all Wisconsin grape. And we have a Marischal Foch that's also an all Wisconsin grape that we grow and bottle and make here. And then we have Saval Blanc that's in our Peninsula White that we mix with apples. So we have three wines that have grapes from Wisconsin. Now we're going into a new venture called Door County Distillery. We're going to start distilling right here connected to the winery. We're going to start off with vodka and cherry vodka. Distilling is more in the brewing industry rather than winery. And a lot of the vodka, especially the vodka we produce, is from grain. We're hoping to turn out over 6,000 cases a year is what we're planning on doing. We do over 50,000 cases of wine. 
We started Pet Expressions in 1990 with Doggy Delights, our dog treats, which are all natural and they're made with real fruit. The natural treats were just starting to hit the market and there were no fruit cookies at that point. Maxine loved bananas and oranges and all of that, so it developed from that. People really wanted breed-specific items. We do carry something of a hundred different breeds. We have seasonal items, a golf section and a fishing section. We also have a toy section for children. Our clothing has gotten to be very well known. I pick different designs than you would find in most market areas. Some of the funny things that dogs do when they do come <laughs> in, they'll steal our own treat off our shelves because it is at their level and we create that so that they can sniff and kind of have fun with that. They'll take a toy off the shelf. Mom and dad will decide that that's the toy they want to buy for the dog and then we have actually seen the dogs leave the store with it in their mouth. It's a unique uh, campground and the fact that the 200 owners that we have, they're able to, because they own their own lot, build decks and landscape their property in such a fashion, it really makes it a home away from home. And their dream was we own collectively a campground and we're going to take care of it. Create the best environment that we can for those that visit us, our guests. Our demographic is for families. The campground has uh, over 290 acres of property. We've got two water slides. And uh, we just installed this year what we call the Harbor Oasis. And we have a sandy beach now. We put inflatables like a 12-foot water slide that's out there and a trampoline. The uh, jumping pillow was just added, about the size of a basketball court. And it's an inflatable the kids bounce on. And it's, it's hard to keep them off of the thing. Our trick here is we want everybody to have fun. Kids from the city don't know where milk comes from. They think it comes from the carton in the store. You know, here you can see the live cow, you can see the cow being milked, you can see the happy cow, you know, how we treat them. They can go out to the petting zoo, they can see the baby calves, they can see the pigs, the goats, and they can walk through a cornfield and a corn maze. We do a huge corn maze, it's a 40 acre corn maze, uh, 10 miles of trail. It's all uh, computer generated and uh, GPS cut. What, the way it's designed on the computer is the way it looks from overhead. And then watch the videos uh, while the cows are being milked, you know, it kind of shows how we feed the cows and stuff. This was my grandma's farm. Her dad actually built the original barn, and my grandma and grandpa farmed it, and my dad. We were milking around 100 cows, uh, and now we're currently milking 500 cows. It's an experience to show the kids, you know, where food comes from, and they can see it. It's on a real working farm. It's not a imitation behind the screen. I said, the cows are back there, so. Door County Coffee and Tea kind of started just coffee roasting. That was our mission. We thought people believed and deserved a better cup of coffee. We start our breakfast about 7.30 and we don't do any frying because we really want your first impact, your, the aroma, to be the coffee and fresh bakery. We have wonderful egg dishes, Amish oatmeal. Many of those items are also served on our lunch menu. Out of our 100 coffees, we really have a variety that I think everyone could be satisfied with. We start with absolutely the best beans money can buy. And if you look on every package, it's called Specialty Class 1 Arabicas, which is the best in the best. To that, we roast um, in a fluidized airbed roaster. We use the best flavorings. Everything we do is to care and honor the beans, so to speak, because we want you, no matter when you're drinking it, to have the best cup of coffee you've ever had. We used to joke, you know, we're in Carlsville and people would say, where is that? And really now it's kind of taken on a life of its own as well. Everything that we see as Rock Island now is a state park. We're small, but we're really unique in that we don't allow vehicles or even bicycles on the island. Everybody that comes here walks through the trees, and we have uh, the Rock Island Woods State Natural Area, with an area of 700 acres is basically uncut. And the biodiversity of the island, because of our location, is um, absolutely magnificent. There's uh, lots and lots of rare flowers and things that we have because of our environment along the lake as well as the old mature growth forest. 
when we go out to the, take walks in the forest, it is the quiet we pay attention to. And it automatically silences people just by being out there in the quiet. When they come here and see this effort uh, by Thorderson to visualize some meaningful past experience that he had as an Icelander in his youth, trying to build something, and the paradoxes that he brought here, because at one point he wanted to preserve the island, and on the other point he wanted to completely change it. Chester was a man of means at the time because he had demonstrated how to build high voltage transformers. Not to mention that Chester was a man of vision and an actual genius when it came to the electrical field. He had over a hundred patents to his name and others had said that had he wanted to be a rich man, a powerful man, his company easily could have surpassed the, the company we know called GE or General Electric. Through the efforts of a lot of the hard work of the local people, Chester's estate was sold to the state of Wisconsin for a mere, uh, I believe they sold it for about $175,000 uh, in 1965. It cost way more than that to build just the boathouse. So the, the boys lived up to Chester Thordeson's wishes to keep it all intact. They kept it all in one piece and the state was able to buy this and make it into a, the, the crown jewel of the park system. We're sitting on the west steps of the Potawatomi Lighthouse on Rock Island. And the history of this lighthouse goes way, way back. The original one was built in 1836. And so this thing is really built. The walls are 30 inches thick or better out of stone. It's more like a castle or a fortress. All the stone was cut locally. The guys knew what they were doing. They carefully cut it out of the cliffs here and, and milled it to size dug the foundation down to the bare bedrock, which is, in this case, just a few inches under the dirt. The original lighthouse keeper here was David Corbin, and he lived alone on the island. There were uh, quite a few families of Potawatomi Indian that lived here, but he was the only European. Through the years, various keepers served here. Sometimes it would be a, a husband and wife, more often it would be two families. The lighthouse served, um, admirably through the years until about uh, 1946 was the last family that was here and it was decommissioned at that point and became battery operated. Basically it sat vacant until 1989 at which time the Friends of Rock Island decided it needed to be restored and they began the long arduous process of acquiring friends, stripping out the lead paint, stripping every square inch and totally restoring. It's an ongoing project and uh, every year we try to add a little bit to it. The new light is, a, a we call it the erector set tower. It's about 150 feet straight west of where I am. Solar powered, uh, got a battery, and about every two years the Coast Guard comes and checks on, on the service of that light. Uh, we've caught something that is in a time warp, blending many different things. We have an archaeological site that go back 2,500 years, and then we have this that goes back to the Depression era, signifying man's footprint on Rock Island or on the Niagara Escarpment. And every time man lays his footprint on this, it has had an impact, and we have a microcosm of that impact. We have Indian ruins and these buildings, and we're trying to keep them intact. What the DNR hopes to do here is sort of capture this in time and not let radical change happen here anymore. We're trying to preserve it as it is without too much work on it, and I think people see that and expect it and respect it. Thanks for joining us today. Remember to come back often to find out more about Door County's history, landscapes, businesses, and people.
For updated information about this beautiful peninsula, visit DoorCountyToday.com. I'm Paul Renier for Door County Today. See you next time.